Hello, my name is Linda Milhaven. I'm one of your Scottsdale City Council members, and today we're here to talk about the Desert Discovery Center, also known as the DDC. In January of 2016, the City Council awarded a contract to Desert Discovery Scottsdale, and the first page of the contract reads in part, it is the desire of the city to consider development of a facility to be known as the Desert Discovery Center, dedicated to introducing the Arizona residents and tourists to the wonder of the Sonoran Desert through conservation and environmental education, including its history, uniqueness, and sustainability through many varied and instru instructional exhibits, special programming, and research. The contract goes on to define the scope of work to include identifying funding sources, including private donors, creating a business plan, and designing the spaces and experiences at the center. Final recommendations are will be presented to the City Council next fall in 2017. Today, we're joined by partners of the Desert Discovery Center Scottsdale, Tom Hennis and Amanda White with THINK. They've been hired to help define the experience of the center. Tom and Amanda, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. We're very excited to hear about your thoughts and learn about your work on the center. But first, tell us about THINK and tell us about yourselves. Well. Think started about 25 years ago. I was a theatrical designer for many years in New York for about 15 years and started to move into more interactive kinds of environments and theme parks and, and uh, ultimately museums and aquariums. And I found the work just fascinating and so I developed Think as a practice to begin to develop these kinds of projects and we've done a whole variety of different uh, kinds of installations from the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco to the 9-11 Museum in New York and currently working on a lot of projects including this one. Oh, two impressive projects. Amanda, tell us about yourself. I've been working with Think for three years and uh, the projects that we're working on at the moment, um, the, the focus of the work that we're doing is a lot around the way that people interact with the natural environment and I think that is part of what's so exciting for us about this project. Uh, we're working on the um, sustainability pavilion for the Dubai Expo 2020. And that and many other projects, including the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, uh, really pointing the firm in the direction of looking at the way that we are going to, as humans, adapt to this world as it continues to change. Sounds like ex exciting work. So tell us a little more about what interested you in this project and why you think you were a good fit. Well, a lot interested us in this project. For one thing, we came out to see the desert for the interview and it, we fell completely in love with it. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to use this absolutely beautiful patch of desert to inspire people to conservation and to build on the um, the the the, the mission of, of conserving uh, that piece of desert toward a broader view of sustainability and how to live in arid regions in the world. And for us, that's a wonderful, wonderful mission. Wonderful. So you live in New York. There are some who might ask uh, what New Yorkers know about the desert environment. What would you say to those folks? Well, deserts are harsh environments, and New York is uh, not really that much different. <laughs> No, but seriously, we've done a lot of research and we've spent a lot of time in different environments. Amanda's done a whole lot of research. Mm. Yeah, tell us more about the research you've done about the Sonoran Desert. So the, we, one of the wonderful things about this project uh, that we um, knew about from the beginning and, and have been working on ever since is the relationship, the partnership with the uh, ASU, with Arizona State University. They have been able to provide us with a wealth of material. Um, they're experts who are working on everything from desert research, looking at the environment itself, at the species in the desert, at the soil crust, and you know all manner of very detailed and focused research, through to their um, sustainability institute and the way that they are looking at issues of. Uh, global sustainability and the relevance of that for this project. So we're extremely lucky to be working in partnership with them and garnering as much material as we can from their experts and um, starting to use that to develop a series of exhibits for this experience. Um, we translate that material into things that are going to be accessible to the audiences that come. So it's a very rich partnership for us. One of the things that's so exciting about a project like this, we do a lot of work, as Amanda said, with uh, ecology and, and with the natural world. And when you move from sort of one project to another, one ecosystem to another, 
you find there are these fantastic threads that, that move right. all the way through and you find you know one thing is more extreme in the desert environment one thing is more extreme in a rainforest or in the plains and yet the ecological principles remain constant and they're fascinating and once you begin to explore one you want to explore another and then another and another and so this is a very very rich uh, kind of environment to work in wonderful describe more of your work to date the thing is too that this is not limited to the ecological history or the biodiversity of the region of the desert of the preserve itself but also reaches into the cultural stories of this place and so we're also working in partnership with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community and they will help us develop stories about their past and their present and the way that they have lived and continue to live in the desert and when we say when we talk about living in the desert that is a big part of the concept that we're working with and so it's not we think of the desert as not being limited to the natural environment that is you know currently undeveloped we look at the whole place we look at Scottsdale itself as part of that desert and we really think about the way that people have lived and continue to live in this place and the role that a center like the Desert Discovery Center can play in helping people to understand that that is also its potential for future generations so how do we think about that this is this is so important and in so many of our projects we are tracing the human narrative in these landscapes and tracing the combination of history and science and technology and also indigenous knowledge how people operated in the land thousands of years ago and when we're really successful we can bring all of these different systems together to really understand our position in in this environment and our place in the world and how we can live much better than even 50 years ago well, 20 interesting years interesting perspective i think most of us think about the plants and animals but expanding it to be the human history in the desert makes it a, a much richer story richer story so yeah, i know you've done some work to date um, describe what you've done uh, so far in developing the project well we have a slide that uh, shows the view of the this part of the preserve the, the gateway mm -hmm. um, in the middle of it there's a little sort of round dot that's the, the parking lot and if we stand uh, at that site and we were actually there this morning checking out what what we could see there mm -hmm. there are extraordinary sight lines that take you out to the mountains to the north that take you up the watershed to the northeast looking back toward the city to the southwest and these wonderful view sheds become really uh, powerful interpretable moments. So if we go to the next slide, this is a view up the watershed and, and to the untrained eye, it's beautiful, it's absolutely gorgeous, but it's relatively undifferentiated. But if we go to the next, we can overlay a, for instance, one kind of interactivity where we've got a digital sandbox where you can sculpt a form that's like the one you're seeing and then watch digitally how water would flow over it or differences in temperature from the high to the low so people can explore that in detail. Uh, the next view is a wash and imagine being able to look into this environment, have a framed view into it and then digitally up in front of it comes a series of other views so you can look at it through time, you can see it with water coursing through it, you can go back in time and see how it was formed you can look at the close-in ecosystems that the animals and plants that occupy the near zone. Or in the next one, we have a broader landscape. And if we zoom into that, we can sort of pick out these different sight lines that um, let us highlight specific things in the landscape that might be of interest to people that they'd otherwise fail to notice. So just by putting these these viewports in, we can, we can bring this to life. In the next one, we have uh, a close-up of a saguaro cactus. Now, these are amazing organisms, and they form whole ecosystems around them. And so we can put a platform near one just by levering a little piece of the center off so that people get a wonderful view of it and then interpret that view digitally and let people get up close and personal without hurting the cactus. So these are the kinds of things that we want to be able to do. I think there's one more 
that um, you know, these, these are fabulous, these uh, teddy bear choya cactuses. So they look a little bit top heavy and you kind of wonder how do these things stand up? Mm -hmm. But if you're able to kind of peel up the ground and, and do an exhibit where you can go around behind, you'll see that their roots actually grab onto boulders that are buried in the, in the substrate. So it's an opportunity to see what, uh, what is invisible. So this is the kind of thing that we are beginning to explore. These are just preliminary concepts. But as they start to come alive, uh, we'll be able to populate this uh, as a very kind of rich and interactive environment. Can I add anything to that? Yeah, I think what you can see here is the way that we're really grounding the Desert Discovery Center in its site, in, in the preserve and in this place, so that people are getting an understanding. They're looking at these views, but what we're doing as a context to that is really unpacking what everyone can see around and in that view. And that's not limited to the species, the animals and the plants that you would see in this place, but it's actually revealing the past. It's revealing the cultural story of that place. It's revealing other kinds of perspectives on what you can see. So it gives people a rich and layered understanding of those places. Wonderful, wonderful. It also gives us the chance to see events like a haboob or a lightning storm in the desert and to be able to experience these temporal events. So it's first off about what you can see in the landscape and second, what can't you see? Oh. What can we uncover through the exhibits? Third, how do we learn from this place? What can we learn? What can we learn by really closely observing? And then fourth, having learned something new, how do we apply that? How do we envision the future? How do, what kind of future do we want to envision living in the desert, living in arid regions? One of the things that's so important, by, 25, by 2030, 50% of the world's population will be living in arid regions. And if we're going to live well in those places, it's absolutely essential that we understand them, that we fall in love with them, that we learn to use their resources wisely. So these exhibits are an opportunity to explore in this way, to explore how people in the past have done it, how indigenous people have done it, how early settlers did it, how people did it without air conditioning. And also to learn from the past where, for instance, this land was grazed at one point and you know, now it's being tended and cared for. There are paths that have been carefully carved into it. There are uh, portals where people can enter it, but it's thriving because it's being looked after in a very different way. And this is the kind of thing we want to cast a light on and really give people an opportunity to explore. Interesting, because folks will say, well, we can learn by taking a hike. And what you're suggesting is showing us things and uh -huh. teaching us things that we might not be able to learn on a hike yes, that and, we couldn't yeah. see. And absolutely take that hike. Take that hike. Absolutely <laughs> take that <laughs> yeah. hike. But if we are successful, you will see a hundred things you never would have seen before. You will understand in ways that you wouldn't have understood before. You'll gain insight into both the place and the people who have been in the place and your own relationship to it. That really can't happen if you just kind of go out and take a hike. Uh, I sort of had a similar experience. I did my hours several years ago to become a steward. Mm. And I was fascinated to learn that the plants and animals are adapted from tropical climates and how they adapted and why the two rainy seasons makes our desert unique. And I never would have learned that going on a hike, but having a center for all of us to learn would be an amazing yeah. thing. And, you know, the, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the, the steward program yeah. is an um, terrific, uh, it's an amazing program and it's a great inspiration to us. We've actually been starting to build an idea that would shift part of the focus of this center to young people, to uh, training people, to, to internships where somebody, for instance, who's going into a professional career might be able to spend three months learning about sustainability. Or somebody doing a gap year might spend a year really learning deeply. But really giving people an opportunity the way you had the opportunity to learn deeply about the environment and then give something back to the people who visit, but also learn from the people who visit. Because sustainability is a discussion. It isn't a one-way lecture about this is the way we do it. Mm -hmm. It's about us really understanding how we as a society go forward and live well in the planet.
Right. Yeah, we all, you make a, a wonderful point. We all talk about sustainability, but what, what exactly is that and how does that change over time? I'm fascinated. You said 50% of the world mm -hmm. will live in an arid climate by 2030. Yes. That's extraordinary. Yeah. And what an amazing role we can play in helping understand how to live in that world. Exactly. And even the, the built form of what we put into this landscape will be an opportunity for teaching people about how to make environments that are fit for living in these kinds of places and that doesn't and that that means thinking about how to put renewable energy in and use you know use that to to create an environment that's actually livable and not just for survival but for you know for a good life for well-being in these kinds of places you know these are the kinds of things that we can really share we can we can implement research projects with AS, ASU to happen there and then share with the rest of the world so you talk about the built environment. I was going to ask you a little bit later, but since you mentioned it, I'll talk about it now. Been a lot of conversation in the community about how big this is going to be. Anything you can share with us about how big the building is, how big the footprint might be? Just the right size. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're looking at the location in the preserve as something that is very important and, and something that is almost sacred. It is an opportunity to engage that landscape very directly and very profoundly. At the same time, there's no reason to put a bunch of offices out there. There's no reason to put a bunch of back facilities out there. And frankly, probably not a reason to put a lot of research labs out there. So we're actually looking at a paradigm now that um, John Saylor, the architect, has begun to develop, which would have an off-site facility that has kind of non-essential elements or their essential elements, but not essentially on the site, and pull as much of that off the site as possible so that the elements that go on the site that can be right-sized to the site are those that are really important for the experience, that are really important for the educational mission, and really important for giving people a profound insight into this environment and into the way it can be inhabited. And then you're touching on the other important conversation we've had in the community, which is location. Folks have argued in the preserve, not in the preserve. What's your point of view on that? I think that's a very legitimate argument, but my point of view is that people respond very powerfully, very powerfully to authentic experiences when they're able to encounter the real thing and then explore it in greater depth you get an exponentially greater level of experience than when you recreate something off the site that isn't authentic. And so I think the real question is, how do we achieve the maximum impact from the preserve? Because you know, for this generation, everybody knows why the preserve is there. It's for the public good. But in the next generation, are people going to remember that? Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we teach people why we preserve? And I think doing it on the site, doing it in the presence of this living environment, being able to experience it tactily, being able to smell it, being able to touch things not out in the landscape but brought close to you, being able to interpret what's there in situ is a very important way for people to gain a much more emotional, much more full-bodied experience of the place. This is really about a shift in thinking about what preservation means as well, because the preserve is a is such a core and a significant part of Scottsdale's identity. It really is, and the people that we've met and worked with so far, they embody a passionate dedication to that place. It's something that makes our work so wonderful when we when we get to share that. Passing that on through something like this is critical for the community. And this is an opportunity to really help people see the value of this place through their own experience of being, being there, learning as much as they possibly can about it. We'll be bringing school children in who will you know, also communicate that message back into their families. Um, and this is, you know, this is really a, an important piece of work. And I think that the idea of what it means to preserve, to look after, to, to care for these um, areas around the world is a movement that the centre is going to be part of. 
You know, one thing that's so important about this area, I think, is that it, it, it teaches us its robustness. There are environments where you would not want to send a million people a year out into a place or two million or three million. In this case, we're looking at a small fraction of that. Um, but this is a place where with carefully controlled conditions, you can preserve the environment. You can protect it and people can experience it directly. And there's just, there's just nothing like that experience. Yeah, you touch on an interesting community conversation around protecting the pristine desert, but as you've already mentioned, it's been, ranch and uh -huh. been ranched and been home to indigenous peoples. Um, they, we talk about preserve versus park, and yet we've got trails where folks get into the preserve and, and enjoy it, and we're looking at just yet another way. And so it's a constant balance between preserving the desert and the ecosystems and giving people a way to learn and enjoy uh -huh. the desert. And I think you make an important point about so future generations recognize the same value this generation sees in, in, that, in that desert. Absolutely. A past generation even did mining in in what is now the preserve. <laughs> and, you know, we're trying to mine for knowledge and, and mine for insight, not for minerals. What yeah. a great way to look at it, right? I guess we'd all be horrified to think about mining it from <laughs> right. Right. today, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. what, yeah. but that's certainly part of the legacy and the tradition of the preserve. But look how far we've come. Yes, so. yes, look how far we've come. It's, a, it's amazing, 30,000 acres and a billion dollars. Mm. Uh, and what, what a great opportunity for us to learn. Well, this is an extraordinary statement by the people of Scottsdale. Yeah. Yes, it really is. Visionary and leadership and a very strong grassroots movement. Yeah. And a dedication to inclusivity as well, because being inclusive for all the communities in Scottsdale is a really important part of the vision for this centre. And there are people who don't, aren't able, they aren't able to hike. They, they don't have access to the preserve in the same way that a lot of people do. Um, there are accessible trails, but this can be so much more than that. And uh, we've, we've heard stories about people who are just on the edge of their seat waiting for this to happen because they know that it's going to give them their opportunity to really feel like part of this preserve. Well, and I hike the preserve, but I think about, you know, my nephews are 11, 9, and my mm. niece is 6. Mm. Imagine taking them on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> to learn about what the preserve right. is. We're not going to take a hike, but we'd certainly go to a center to learn more. I think yeah. there's lots of people, lots of situations that mm. would, would benefit greatly from it. Uh, you talked about putting non-essential services in another location, and I know in conversations we've had, we said one of the guiding principles that you're working with is only put in the preserve that which absolutely needs uh -huh. to be in the preserve. Uh, what other guiding principles have you developed as you work through developing this concept? Well, one of the things that we've been working closely with John and with, um, with the sustainability consultants, um, Darup and Bright Green, is really thinking of this not so much as a building, but as, a, as an instrument, as a, as a tool or a set of tools for observing the landscape and for educating people. But the, the, the current idea for the buildings, which is evolving uh, daily, we, we, we've been sketching uh, in real time in the last few days, really restricts the areas that are, for instance, air conditioned to a very tiny proportion. And we're thinking about, different ways to make the space feel cool without using energy and the use of water on the site, the use of shade and, and being able to demonstrate shading, being able to demonstrate really smart building methodologies using mass to control the thermal gain, using orientation to control the sun angles coming in and at the same time producing these wonderful view corridors that let us really look out into the, into the landscape. One of the other things that we've talked about um, is letting the, you know, you know, we think of buildings as boxes, but we don't have to, we don't have to think of them that way. We think of floors as flat. Well, we don't have to think of them that way either. We have to think of controlled slopes so that people with disabilities can can navigate them easily. But at the same time, there are many places on the site where we can actually let the floor slope with the landscape let it direct our motion and direct our attention to where it's, it's going to hit a point of, of, of illumination or excitement. And so I think the idea of building is becoming very, very fluid on the site and very, very exciting. And uh, John Sather is talking about this as really being uh, leveraging the great architecture that's already there. The, there's a collection of buildings that are really quite beautiful, very simple, very strong 
uh, very lasting aesthetic. And to, as he says, stand on the shoulders of that and develop our own vocabulary, but build on the vocabulary that's there. We can make something that's extraordinarily beautiful and sustainable and enjoyable. I think if, if we had to you know, look at the principles that are helping guide us through the whole process too, there are really two areas. One is being inclusive, which we've talked about a little, and the other is to be sustainable. And within that, one of the things that we've really pursued is a, a model of collaboration, because we believe that that is a that is the way to, um, to work and develop a project like this, but it also protects it and makes sure that it, um, as an investment of this community in this place, continues to see a return. And that return is, is social, it's cultural, it's an investment in the education of coming generations. Uh, it's all of these things. And so we are collaborating, we've mentioned ASU and uh, we're working with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, we're working with the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy and the Field Institute and a number of other people, colleges and education partners and other institutes that are feeding into this development so that it really is made by and for the people of Scottsdale and that's very important to us in our practice. That's and this week, as you know, we're meeting with hundreds of individuals in numerous meetings that are sort of back to back and having robust exchanges about what people like about it, what people don't like about it, what, that, what catches their imagination, what they wish for. And this is something that kind of defines our practice as well. People often ask me, you know, what's experience design? And, uh, and at the simplest, it's, it's designing these environments. But what the practice is really about is meeting with people and communities and understanding what is needed in a particular place at a particular moment in time because unlike architecture what we do is contextual to the human experience it's contextual to society to the culture of a community to people's memories to the past to their visions of the future to the environment around them and so what we try to do when we develop projects is to work with the people those projects are meant to serve and work very deeply with them. We've done that in many, many projects, but you know, 9-11 Museum is certainly one that had a broad constituency. We worked with so many communities in South Africa on a project called the Freedom Park. Um, so this is a continuation, even in Dubai, we're working with many, many different communities, with school groups, with leadership, because that project is about you know, how the UAE wants to be seen as a sustainable country. You don't often think of UAE and sustainability in the same, same sentence, and yet they are converting from an oil economy to a very sustainable economy over the next 10 to 15 years. And you know, how do we instantiate that vision in that pavilion? Similarly, Scottsdale has this amazing legacy of caring for the environment that is often at odds with the way people build in the desert. And so how do we work with the community? How do we work with individuals? How do we help people see the same thing in their heads when they think of what this is? And that's a process, not so much of sanding down the differences, but of saying, ah, there's this really valuable thing here in this perspective, and this really valuable thing in this perspective. And if we kind of blend them together, they lose their value, but if we put them next to each other, mm -hmm. oh, now you got something. Yeah. So that's really the kind of process we want to engage in because we think that makes both a, a, a wonderful institution, ultimately, that the public will feel well served by, but it's also answering often unarticulated needs of the community that, that, that only come out when you start to work through a process like this and people go, huh. I want this thing, not that thing. Yes. But I wouldn't have thought of that otherwise. Right, the third, the better third mm -hmm. idea. Yes. The better third idea. Say more specifically so people understand your work this week and how you're going about getting input from the community and the process you're going through this week to, to listen to folks' thoughts. So we've, uh, we've been presenting to a number of groups. Uh, we've, we've been to three groups today and a couple yesterday. Um, from the Chamber of Commerce to the Conservancy and, and other, other groups that are either interested in this or have a, have a stake in it. Uh, we're meeting, I think, with close to 400 people tomorrow. I think we have nine back-to-back -back sessions. Um, 
Um, this is a public workshop that's yeah. happening tomorrow, and um, so and then I think we're also presenting to the tourism department. We're meeting with a um, number of other local community groups from different suburbs, areas around the preserve as well. Uh, so this is really an opportunity for us to talk a little and to listen, to really be able to uh, share where we've got to so far in our thinking, but to you know, garner the feedback of everybody, listen to their thoughts, their concerns and their ideas. And it's, uh, um, it's a very rich process for us. And so I know for tomorrow's uh, listening sessions, the city did an invitation for citizens mm -hmm. to sign up and come to workshops, yes. hear a little bit about your work in progress and what you're saying is, and then you're gonna be listening to what their reactions Absolutely. are. Absolutely, and, and, and both are important because this is a project that a lot of people have heard a lot of things about, and it's evolved over the years, too, because what it was in its previous version is not what it is today. So first of all, it's important, I think, for people to hear where we are right now. This is where we think we've got to. Mm -hmm. These are the things that we th have heard. These are the things we think are important and this is the way we believe this can be extraordinarily effective. Now, how is that either in keeping or at odds with what you're thinking? And, and that's what we need to hear back. But what we're trying also to do is to, to break out of people's preconceptions because in many cases those no longer apply to, the, to what we're doing. We weren't involved in those earlier versions. We've come at it fresh and we've said, you know, let's, let's take a clean slate here and see, see what we can make. That's, so for folks who are, who have decided it's a yes or no question based on previous proposals, what you're saying is you're starting from, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and at, at, at least, you know, hear out where we are today, because you might actually find that it's much more in keeping with something that you'd want to endorse mm -hmm. than you thought. Okay. So rather than ask a yes or no question, say imagine something amazing in the preserve and what might that be. Yes. Uh, much richer conversation, much richer conversation. I know with some of the projects you've done before, you've run into fairly significant differences of opinion among stakeholders. Uh, maybe you could share with us an example of that and, and how you dealt with that. Well, the 9-11 Museum is, is probably the, 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 the clearest example because there were constituents who were, who were part of that who had diametrically opposed views of things. So one example was a, an object that we called the composite, which was actually five floors of the World Trade Center that had been compressed together in the collapse and, and fused together at high heat. And so that was salvaged and pulled aside. And when we saw it, we thought, wow, this is, this is such a powerful thing because 9-11 you know, is about collapse. Um, and it's not just the collapse of a building, but it's the collapse of even the ability to, to talk about things, the ability to, you know, we, the, the narrative of with us or against us is a collapsed narrative. There's no space in between. So this thing embodied that fully. Now, some of the families said that absolutely has to be in the museum because that shows what happened to our loved one. And some of them said equally, you can't put that in there you know, my, my, my son's DNA could be in that, and so I don't want my son on display. Totally legitimate. Both of those are totally legitimate. So what we did was, first of all, the museum uh, had three separate forensic analyses of this to see whether, in fact, any DNA could be traced. And part of it was destroyed, crumbled up, and, and analyzed some of and the rest was done from the surface. So it, it passed that test. There was no discernible DNA. So we said, okay. There is no evidence of that, at least, so we are not knowingly violating this sensibility. Um, but we also thought that that doesn't mean we can just put it out on the floor. So the, the solution ultimately was a very protected space for it to be able to represent it in a way that, that people would understand that this is just not something to be looked at and passed on. But, it, but it's something to be carefully considered. And I think in the end, for at least most people, that was a satisfactory conclusion. And so it's not so much that one is a winner and the other is a loser, as it is that e even, even the people who said don't do it strongly affected the way that it was ultimately displayed, and it also triggered 
a whole series of analyses to at least gain the facts and see whether there was there was a uh, there was evidence for for something that was obvious. Uh, in many ways, that project went from kind of one of these decision points to another because it was always important to take into account the the feelings of people who had lived in the neighborhood, for instance, said, we, we need a representation of, of what was there. Um, the, the family member, there was a man who said uh, of his brother who had been killed, he, 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 was, he was mourning so deeply and he said, we need a, a, a sanctum within a sanctum within a sanctum. And we created a, a, a memorial exhibit that has portraits all around the inner inner side of the outer wall, it creates a zone we call the zone of the many. That's that's separated from the museum proper, so it goes into a quieter zone. And this is where you can s take in the magnitude of what happened. Mm -hmm. But then we created another zone that we call the zone of the one, which you can see in this image here, where the stories of each individual life are told by family members and they play one after another after another and that is an acoustically more quiet space and lower light level and people can sit around the periphery or they can just stand and look in the doorway they can take it any way they like so we took in the uh, the feelings of the, the we, we, we worked with first responders we worked with all kinds of constituencies to try to do something that was powerful and that embodied the kinds of aspirations that each group had. And in places where they contrasted with each other, sometimes that brought the narratives into sharper focus. And so that, that's what we try to do on the, in the projects that we make, that we don't kind of boil them down to a soup where everything kind of feels the same. Mm -hmm but we allow contrast to stand there because these are places where society works out its unfinished business. In Scottsdale, we are seeing contrasting ideas about preservation and about conservation, about sustainability, about the uses of these places. And so we invite that discussion because what, what I think most people don't think about when they think about a site like this is that it's that it's a it's a place to work out difference it's a place to be constructive it's a place to be creative mm -hmm. to find solutions that you wouldn't find in normal discourse because we're making something and that causes us all to look at it at the same time think about it deeply and really engage seriously over it you made a comment earlier about a broader impact to the community if it just teaches us how to engage and discussion and differences of opinion, mm -hmm. respectfully and, and listening. Uh, I think that uh, we'll have even more than an amazing place in the desert, but a, an even richer community. Yeah. So what are the next steps from here? Well, we are continuing to have these conversations this week. Um, you're staying till the end of the week. I'm leaving in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And we will uh, go back to New York and continue working on the exhibition and content side, John Sather and his crew will start to work on the building. Over the next couple of months, we're really beginning to engage in design. So up until now, it's been about concepts, about ideas, about uh, how to highlight uh, the, the richness that's there. And now we're beginning to give form to it. We're beginning to think about where on the site would be the right place to put this. We're beginning to think about the specific views that we could create and then how we could begin to mine those views for knowledge and information and experience. And so that'll be happening over the next several months. The current phase of work uh, draws to a, a preliminary close in the late spring, early summer. And that's also when an economic analysis will be uh, concluded uh, and, uh, well not concluded, but, but uh, drafted. And then toward the end of the summer, the, the, the concept uh, will be in its uh, form to be evaluated by the community and evaluated by the city council. Wonderful. Anything more you'd like to share? I, 
I think just to you know make one final comment about some of the things that Tom's been talking about. I think you know we are so passionate about these kinds of projects because of the potential of these places to engage people, but also to inspire them. And this project is coming at a pretty critical moment on this planet, and we really believe strongly in the potential of these experiences to help people to understand what's happening in the world, what's happening ecologically in the world, what sustainability means, and also how they as individuals can play a role in that and feel like they are part of a community of intent, a community of dedication to some of these things. And we really feel strongly about that and, and you know, that it's important to us um, to be in these places and working on these projects with the community to do that. Thank you. And I would, I would add to that that this if, if you look at this place, and you look this way and this way and this way, you'll see what seem to be different ecologies. And they are very different. They're microclimates, they're all kinds of things. But they're all connected to each other. It's like a tapestry. They're all part of one place. In the same way, when we go to Dubai, and when we come here, and when we work elsewhere, we find you know, the world is increasingly connected and, and, and not just in social media. We are interdependent. What happens in one place affects another place, whether it's through bird migrations that can be disrupted or whether it's through the diseases that can travel very quickly, whether it's through crop plants that we transplant from one place to another or our house plants that move in and start to change ecologies. You know, these things can be positive impacts, they can be negative impacts. The fact is that we are at a point where humans are the species that shapes the way the planet evolves from here. We are not in control of it, but we can disrupt it, we can make it better. And what Amanda said, we are at a critical juncture. The decisions our generation makes and the next generation makes, the people who are alive on this planet today, will be legible in the geology millions of years from now. The residue that we leave behind from our cities, the distribution of animals, the distribution of plants, the climate, the chemistry of the, of the air and the chemistry of the water. All of these things will be laid down. And so this is not just about our generation. This is about looking way into the future. And you can look at that as a huge burden and a lot of people do, and a lot of people want to say, oh, don't, don't go there. But it's also an amazing opportunity because we have places like ASU that are adding to our knowledge of the way this planet functions and our knowledge of the way humans, as our own ecology, live in the world. And we can make choices that we could never make before with great precision and with great certainty about how we want to live and how we want to live not just in the ecology of the world but in this human ecology, this social ecology among each other. And so for us, this project is a wonderful opportunity to marry what is a profoundly local place that people treasure on a one-to-one -one basis with this great global quest of living well in this world for generations to come. And, you know, what could be better? Wow. Uh, you, you inspire me, you excite me, the possibilities. Uh, it's just such an exciting time, and I can't wait to see uh, what you come up with. The implications are, are mind-blowing. So, so thank you so much, um, and thank you for joining us today. And um, for those of you who would like more information about the Desert Discovery Center, go to the city's website, scottsdaleaz.gov, search for Desert Discovery Center, and on that site you can get some more information as well as sign up for email updates, and you'll get invitations to watch the the progress of the project and get your opportunity to put input. So um, Tom and Amanda, thank you very much and thank you, thank for, you. for joining us today.